Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, founder of The Complete Herbal Guide. And today I'd like to just put a shout out and thank our um, sponsor um, from Resync. Re uh, they have a Resync collagen peptides, and this is great because it helps with circulation and it has vitamin C and it also has copper in it, which helps to promote the regrowth of collagen and and layers of tissue in your body. And it also is great for muscle soreness and it also supports joint mobility. So you might wanna take a look at this and it's from Resync and it's collagen peptides. They also have another great product that I wanted to mention and it's called Resync Recovery. And Resync Recovery helps with the blood circulation and it helps to address inflammation. And it's really good also for increasing energy. So these two products are amazing. I've also been taking them. I just don't sponsor them. I actually take them. And it's really been actually, I can really say for myself, it's been helping me a lot. So you might want to check it out. And thank you very much, Resync, for sponsoring this broadcast today. And I have a very special guest I can't wait to introduce her. Her name is Iman and she, uh, Iman Gotti, and she has an amazing story. See, I can't, I'm like, I'm so all over the place because <laughs> it's such a great story. When you hear her story, you're going to be like, oh my God, you know? So Iman, why don't you just tell them a little about yourself, what you do and tell everybody because like your story is just amazing. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That's an awesome intro and I'm so excited to be here. Um, today, life is just so wonderful and so so wildly different from what it could have been. Right. Uh, much like yours, I, you know, now I'm a certified grief recovery specialist and a four-time published author. I'm a speaker right. and a coach, and I love working with people to help them, you know, understand their grief and trauma and then recover from it. Right. So they can truly be themselves. I think in this world, it's actually... It seems like it could be the easiest thing in the world to be yourself because there's only one of you, but it seems really right. difficult with all of our conditioning and anytime we're injured or have trauma and grief that it's hard to be yourself and to re remember who you are underneath all of the, the things that you experience. So oh, I definitely. love to help people get into their power and truly heal so that they can be the most of them that they can be in and really strive for what their dreams are. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Now you tell me a little about your, your past and how you grew up and everything. Cause your story is amazing. I think it'll resonate with so many of the listeners and it'll really, you know, touch them because, you know, you have an amazing story about what you went through in life and how you turned your life around. Can you tell us a little about, if you don't mind about your, your childhood and growing up and everything you had to face a little bit? Sure. No problem. Yeah. So I'm a first generation Canadian. My family came here from Tunisia, North Africa, mm -hmm. and they had stopped in Paris, France to live while my father went to school to be a chef and then came over to Canada and had another. So they had a, one of my brothers in Paris and they had another son and then they came over to Canada and then they moved all the way to Alberta, which is very, very cold <laughs> and very, very different from Africa. Um, so they left the like beautiful hot Mediterranean to come here to the prairies. And, <laughs> and you know, I'm told all the time that my mother really wanted to have a, a little girl that was kind of one of her biggest dreams and desires so she when I was born she named me Shehia which in Arabic is like a strong desire or craving mm -hmm. so it's kind of a funny name which she then later changed because she had a dream that you know a, a man came to her in a dream and told her that my name was actually Iman because Iman meant faith in God and that even though I was her craving that I would need my faith more than her craving. So it's kind of interesting. So she was very superstitious. Wow. So she changes my name because she was scared. She didn't want anything bad to happen after making such like so much wishes for having a little girl. So uh, I was her little shadow and she was just a really, my mother didn't speak English. She didn't have a job. She was a homemaker and she was just one of those people that woke up and started cleaning the house from shop to bottom and cooking. And so our house always had this like yummy aroma of like onions and garlic sauteing plus the smell of bleach because she was like a clean fanatic. <laughs> and it's kind of funny when people think of like what makes you think of home. And I'm like, yeah, bleach and garlic and onions. It's very <laughs> strange perfume but so 
my father worked away a lot because he kind of just had to take whatever jobs he could get at first. Right. And which was nice because she was this very nurturing, loving, you know, you could get away with a lot of stuff around my mom because she was just like a, kind of a softy. And my father was this opposite of her, just very, very strict, very um, fundamentalist Muslim, like just mm-hmm. really religious. And he was violent. He was a very mean person and just had a lot of his own issues. And so he would um, take it out on my mom and my brothers. And so I would witness a lot of him abusing her and yeah. it's really horrible. So he ended up cheating on her and having a mistress in which she asked him to move out, right. which I always think is like very brave, like the yes. most courageous thing you can do when you don't, especially when you don't have any money or any education or speak the language. Right. She, she didn't even have a car. She didn't have a license. She didn't wow. A so it was like very bold of her. Yes. To make a stand for herself. I think I always um, think of that and find so much courage. And so he moved out and we were all kind of a little bit relieved because he didn't really, wasn't at home a lot in the first yeah. place. And then when he left, I got to sleep in my mom's bed because that was, I was like six years old. I was so excited that he because he would always make me sleep alone and I was her little shadow I don't want to be away from my mom so yeah. as soon as he left I brought all my teddy bears to my mom's bed <laughs> I like, this, is, this is what we're doing now and she was okay with it and that's how we lived and he would because he still had the key to our house because she was like listen this is your family you can visit your kids I'm not trying to restrict you right he would come in the middle of the night and just eat our food and make a mess. And he would leave the fridge open and spoil all the food. So we'd wake up and, you know, my mom would have this huge mess to clean. Right. She, she never spoke ill of him. Like she was always like, Oh, you know, Oh, well, your father's a messy guy. Right. So that kind of kept on for a a little over a year. And then right before my seventh birthday, I was sleeping with my mom in her bed, a regular day. And the light flickered on in the middle of the night in the bedroom and so I it it woke me up and I saw my father standing in the doorway and I thought I remember thinking like oh I was excited because I was like you know the only girl I love my dad yeah but then he kind of shushed me and I thought oh yeah don't wake up your mom that's so I kind of scooched closer to my mom so that he could I was assuming he was coming to bed I didn't really understand how life worked yeah and he turned off the light and I kind of thought, oh, geez, don't wake up, you know, just curl up next to her. And then as my eyes adjusted to the dark, I kind of saw something shimmer in his hands. And by the time I realized that it was his butcher's knife, he had been stabbing her and, <gasps> you know, stabbed her. Wow. She, yeah, it was really horrifying. I froze. I really, my whole body went into shock. Oh, yeah. Yeah my brother my eldest brother came in the room and tried to fight him off um but he wasn't able to and so he ran and called the police and then um my father ran away and it was just so I remember it being really quiet I just remember after there was this moment it's almost it was very spiritual it was this moment where I was looking out the window watching him run away out the front and my mother wasn't moving and my brothers hadn't come in the room and I was just standing there and I remember feeling like this knowing, but also this ignorance of, I don't really understand what yes. just happened. Right. I'm not even seven. Yeah. But also this like soulful, you're never going to be the same. Right. This is, your life is different now. Yeah. And it almost hurt. It's when, you know, people describe the silence as deafening. Yeah, yeah. It it really does fill your ear. Like it, it was, ex- it hurt. And I thought that was so strange. And right. then I kind of didn't understand what had happened. So I went over to my mom and tried to wake her up. Um, obviously she didn't wake up. And then the next thing I knew, I just heard all of these sirens and all of the lights. It felt like we lived in a cul-de-sac and all yeah. of the lights turned on and there were just all of our neighbors. And I remember feeling humiliated Mm. it's like the worst thing that could ever happen to you yeah and now everyone's watching it was 
very, you know, it's like every part of my innocence ripped away and I, even my privacy, it just felt very invasive. And yeah, I remember the police officer coming in the room and I often think about this man. He was so kind and his face was so in opposition to what was happening. You know, yeah. he was smiling, he was trying to be welcoming and, and warm and friendly. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, he's so kind and happy. And he right. was just saying, like, come with me. Like, I'm going to take you, you know, and he had this blanket. And, and I thought, okay, but my, like, my mom. And, and so we went out and stood in the street and um yeah then I just remember my mom being carried out in a stretcher and and my brother was trying to be brave and he said don't worry they're gonna take her to the hospital and that's where people get better and I looked at him and I said I think she's dead but I didn't know I don't think I knew what that meant I just remember you know I had two older brothers so they were watching yeah. horror movies and right and yeah yeah and these like silly movies and I remember but not knowing what that meant but I remember thinking no I don't think so I don't think she's getting better I, I mean so yeah and then it was just a whirlwind of um staying with family and and everyone I just remember everyone being so sad and looking at you and trying to smile it was very strange yeah it was the way that the world deals with grief you know I just got to see that all before seven right how uncomfortable not only it made them clearly yeah how uncomfortable I felt where when everyone is looking at you with pity and sadness and despair that you feel and I talk to a lot of grievers obviously in my work and life yeah there's this sense of like you want to you end up wanting to comfort the people trying to comfort you it's yeah it's strange people pleasing thing um so I remember trying to be like I mean, what do you say? Sorry. And people are saying, so, sorry, you know, I'm so sorry, poor thing. And I'm like, it's okay. I'll be okay. You know, you're yeah. just on a brave phase. Yeah. And so um, my birth family, like my aunts and uncles that lived nearby, they ended up, you know, deciding that they wouldn't take care of us. And so they just moved back to Africa. Oh, wow. Yeah, I remember feeling, you know, abandoned again, and I went into foster care and ended up living with uh, a few different families and, you know, at one point connecting back with my brothers in a home and then they moved oh. out because they're much older than me, you know, one's five years older, one's nine years older. So, you know, by the time they turned 16 and 17, they, they just wanted to leave, which I don't blame them for because life yeah. is not easy. So then I ended up alone in these homes and they were just so traumatizing. And I ended up being abused for nine, you know, almost a decade after yeah. that. So, and doing, you know, living with people that were not suitable. People. Yeah. Yeah. It was just really, really horrible. So then you're 18 and you kind of, they go, well, there you go. Yeah. You're now you got to go live your life. And I'm thinking, I don't know how. Right exactly I don't want to stop me how I have no idea I just know that I've been holding on for dear life for right my entire childhood hoping that I wake up the next day it was so, yeah it was very even when I think back and when I wrote my memoir cracked open never broken I it just was like sometimes I read it or I was writing it and I'm like is that me how on earth am I still here how on yeah. earth? Like, what a miracle right and, yeah so I think you know, in my, and then in my twenties, I, I just realized I was really far behind, just so lost. Right. Putting on a, again, that brave face that I always felt responsible to wear so that I didn't yeah. have to hear another, Oh God, poor thing. Or, yeah. So I realized I was very far behind all my peers. Everyone had these dreams and they looked so easy to them, you know, they yeah. oh, I'm going to go to college or university and I'm going to do this and that. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. I haven't thought of that stuff. Right. I am traumatized. Yeah. <laughs> no one has stopped to notice that I have these, you know, disorders and mental illness and, and no one talks about it and no one wants to talk about grief. And it's very obvious to me that it, I make people uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. 
So it's better to be happy and funny and, you know, pleasant and things like that. So I just kind of developed these a variety of masks to wear, especially yeah. in foster care, because you kind of, the most successful children in foster care become chameleons and mm-hmm. you just, oh, we like this? Cool. I like it too. Is that what we're doing? Great. I just want to fit in. I don't want to stand right. out. So I just, but little did I know that I would use those skills, you know, as a, a, a professional Yeah, but, and I'm very sensitive to how, you know, people's behaviors and discomfort and the energy in the room. And I can, I can feel people's grief when I'm with people. And I think that's, what's one of my superpowers of working with people is that when you're traumatized and neurodivergent, you really sense things in other people that I think a lot of people miss. Yeah, definitely. You know, and I think there's a look that we all have Mm -hmm. when we've been heartbroken that we can see in each other. And I think I always want to be the person that you don't have to feel uncomfortable around, but if you do, you're welcome. I won't make, I won't add any discomfort for you. Right. I just think that what grievers need most is to have someone suffer with them. I kind of get like you, you were basically hanging by a string and, yeah. you know, like you said, you were putting all these masks on, you were just faking it till you made it, you know? And it probably, when you, I know for sure, when you do that for so long, you kind of lose your own understanding of who you are as a person. Yeah. And then w- once you take, you don't know, you take the mask off. You don't know who you are. You don't, you know don't want to take it belong. off. Yeah. You feel yeah. like you're more of this costume for so long. It's so embarrassing. You know, you feel naked without it. And yeah, that was my whole, you know, I'm 41 now. That was the entire, <laughs> I feel like my twenties were all, oh God, I don't want to be me. This is awful. I, I, what mask am I supposed to wear now? Yeah, And it became you know, so I start, I wanted to have my dreams and it just became so obvious that unless I admitted defeat at the time, what felt like defeat was, which was, was like, I'm not normal. I'm not like you guys. Yeah. I can't just pretend anymore. I'm not, this isn't working for me. I'm miserable in my soul. I cannot yeah. have connections are hard for me. I can't relate to other people unless I'm pretending and that's yeah. not relating. So they, so I would have all these people that would feel super connected to me. Right mask (laughs) and I I didn't feel that way you know so I realized I'm like okay well if we're gonna keep being on the planet we really need to admit that we're screwed (laughs) and yeah maybe someone can help me because I I think that you become really proud as well as uh, you know having this horrible you're really at the bottom of every marginalized group you know yeah yeah, I'm, I I don't have a whole family unit. I witnessed a murder. I was severely assaulted in all of the horrible ways you wouldn't want any child to be assaulted. I'm not white. Uh, like, it's just like all of these. I was like, wow. Yeah. And, and then I have, you know, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's uh, very hard also. Oh, and ADHD. So I'm not learning the way people seem to be teaching. <laughs> like, it was very hard. And yeah, I just finally was like, all right, well, either put me in the loony bin or help me or, or I can't live here anymore because this is really hard. So I just decided to be a guinea pig and go to therapy and really- Good for learn. you. Thank you. Learn about myself because I had to, I think when you grow up with no, very little support or no, you know, and a lot of abuse, you learn to abuse yourself eventually. Like it just, like you just start it's believing. Natural because you're in that environment. That's all you know. So if you're yeah. in an abusive environment or hurtful environment, that's those, those traits, those, those qualities that you see around you are the only things, you know, so either you duplicate it yes. and, or you find people in your world that can relate to you, but they're on the bottom of the barrel also. So right. they're not pumping you up to move forward. So that's right. you're kind of caught in this, in this whirlwind of negativity, you know, mm-hmm. and you know, after having all that in your life, like you went to therapy and what did therapy do for you? Like, how did you get to the root cause the, you know, and be able to overcome probably the, all those repressed emotions that you probably had? I think the reason I waited to go to, th- you know, I had been in therapy, like, cause in foster care, I was like assigned, you know, I had yeah. to go to therapy, but I never tell them the truth. You know, they ask all these questions and they're like, oh, I'm good. 
I'm mm-hmm. fine. Yeah, we're good. I'm good. I don't really want to be here. So right. I'm just going to like say the minimum amount of things for you to go away. Yeah. And so I realized I was scared. What if they thought I was crazy? You know, right. and then I don't know. I'm a kid. So I have all this imagination and I'm a writer, right? So like my yeah. imagination was wild. I'm thinking, no, I'm nuts. They're going to put me away. This is not good. Um, so I just read a lot. And I think, you know, a lot of people can uh, relate to that when you just want to live in another place, you just r- become obsessed with reading and writing. And I would write poetry and hide it under my bed. And I just, when I became an adult, I thought, okay, well, wouldn't you like to know if you're actually loony, you know, <laughs> wouldn't that, <laughs> you know, like maybe like, would it not be kind of a, a tool? So yeah. I went and I remember being so afraid and I hope anyone here listening and watching this, that if you are thinking about going to therapy and you're just like, what if they, think, what if they lock me up? Yeah. You know, the most, they most likely wouldn't if you're having those thoughts, but I went there and, and it was so beautiful because it was finally like, oh honey, there's a whole reason you're like that. Yeah. There's so many, yes, of course you're like that. Right. What happens to almost everyone who has these similar, you know? And I thought. Exactly. And so, so for, I went from the alien outcast to here are your people. Here's why your brain is like that. Right. Someone who just literally went to school and studied about me. Right. And I thought, oh, okay. Well, then I'm going to tell you a few other things because I was holding back. So here's the other <laughs> thing. And then, and then I found out, you know, I had complex. Well, they don't tell you it's post-traumatic stress disorder, but there's a complex version. Mm-hmm that when you have, you know, continued trauma and, and an abuse that it's becomes different, like difficult or impossible to extract who you are, which you mm-hmm. touched on this a minute ago from the trauma before, because there's no before there's only right. up to just about seven years of before. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, those have made my life what they are because my mother was so loving and attentive and I had a, a familial, you know, place of safety and and education and so you know my I'm so thankful to this day about how much my mother showed me love and how she connected with me because it saved my life oh yeah well you she taught you how to love because some people don't even get that some people come from a dysfunctional family where both people don't know how to display love and then they get lost they come out of the world not knowing how to shoot you know display display love so at least you had that from your mom totally that's like you know, the golden nugget that I had. And so I would hang on to it. So she taught me how to love, but also what I deserved. Good. And and so I think that it always just was in such contradiction to what I was being, you know, experiencing. So I was always like, no, you guys are wrong. No, that's not, that's not right. I'm not stupid. I'm not worthless. No. You know, I just never really all the way believed it, even if I would have bad habits or, you know, depression about it. Mm-hmm. I just there was this underlying no something's wrong with you right <laughs> my, right my mama knows best and so I hung on to every word and I would often what now people call like you know affirmations in the mirror and mirror work it's very funny because a lot of people who are traumatized actually start doing these things because it feels good naturally right. and so I was trying to remember the things my mom told me yeah and I look almost identical to her so I would look in the mirror to see her. Yeah. And I would say the things she told me. And I just started reparenting myself. Oh, yeah. And that was, I did it every day. And I would have a microphone eventually. I started to do it, you know, to my teddy bears. And I would crawl up on the, you know, the deep freeze, like, you know, those giant freezers in the cold room and these old houses that I lived in. And, I would have all my teddy bears there and I would get up with my fake microphone and I would be like, hello, welcome to the Iman show. Right. And I (laughs) had no idea that I would one day do that to live audiences of thousands of people and be able to speak (laughs) what I feel in my soul to other people. Right. Yeah. I just love that. I think that it started off with just like a desperation of my mother's words, not fading in my memory. Yeah. That's now, yeah, I want to be like the person who does that for people that maybe don't have those words anywhere else. I think, you know, it, it's so hard to break behavioral, you know, um, 
you kind of get like when you have certain types of behaviors, it's tr it's hard to break that habit because you lived that life for so long, but it can be done, you know, yeah. and people who go through post-traumatic stress disorder or they go through, you know, ADHD and they go through, you know, uh, attention deficit disorder, they, you know, it's, it's very, very hard to cope in life, but people have to at some point realize nobody is perfect. And we do, you know, everybody has a story to tell. I'm sure that if you got everybody in the room, they would be some type of tragic story someone would repeat. But it's a, the key is how we cope with it and mm -hmm. how to move on. Now, what was your key? How were you able to break those habits? How were you able? Now, you said you, you spoke to yourself. You remembered your mom, how yeah. she was. You used that as a role model, a mentor for you. But you had all those other things in life that kind of gave you a negative impact and, and kind of like, you know, we always remember the bad things before the good things. And those yeah. bad things, you know, are very harsh. And you had to actually probably learn how to forgive your father, forgive what happened, to move on. Because forgiveness, I think, plays a big role also. What did you do to move on? Yeah, I think you touched on so many really powerful things there. So... First of all, I wouldn't be who I am without acknowledging that there's this man. I We've adopted each other unofficially. And mm -hmm. I call him my, my dad because he knew me from the day that my mother was killed. He came to say sorry. Aww. And he said he saw me and he said you were just this sad little, you know, it was heart wrenching. And yeah. he said, I promised to always take care of you and your, your siblings and um, he he's kept his word. He's now like he's the man who walked me down the aisle. He's the one who's oh. in college. He's I can't thank him enough in this life, you know. So um his name is Ron and he so I always had this like spark of light that was always there. And he would always remind me, like, don't you know, don't worry about it. We got it, we're gonna get it, whatever, you know. He would always make my dreams come true, just a little bit, a little bit. And he would yeah he taught me to be an entrepreneur when I was 12 years old because he had this. He owned his motel and he would let me come to his house for the summers and he would let me, you know, he, he'd let me help. Right. So he'd be like, Oh, you know, we have to do laundry or whatever. Right. And I remember doing this people's laundry and then they would tip me. And I thought, Oh my gosh, this guy gave me a dollar. Like, this is so cool. Yeah. And he, said, oh. and he said to me when I was 12, he goes, well, you're an entrepreneur now. That's my, <laughs> you know? And I thought I am. And I just remember, you know, thinking how powerful it is to tell children all of these wonderful things that they can be because I would go home to my foster homes and hear how horrible I was. And he was this person that was always like, yeah, you can do it. Sure you can. Yeah, life is for you too. And so when I became an adult, he's the one who said like, honey, you got to go to college. Like, I'll pay you your rent. Just go to college. And he's like, because the world's not as nice to you as it is to everybody else. And I thought, oh, and he's teaching me about privilege and you're trying not to say it in a rude way, but like, you don't have any, and yeah. uh, you know, other than living in a beautiful, of course, like a really wonderful country and things like that. But then, yeah, yeah, of course, but he was saying like, you're on the lower end of privilege. Like you need to go <laughs> to school and do things on purpose. So when I started going to therapy, you know, I wasn't telling anyone, Oh, I'm going to therapy. I was ashamed. Right. Like, Oh my God, I'm going to go to therapy. Right. So, I think a lot of people are like that, but it's nothing to be ashamed of. So no, go on. No, but it's so, yeah, because of the stigma. Yeah. So I started also exercising. There was all this energy that I needed to get out and in grief recovery, that's what we're doing. We're trying to get people the energy out of them. Yeah. have that completion feeling. And so I remember when I was 25 years old, I had, I used to live in Scotland. I lived there for a couple of years. And so when I came back to Canada, I got this call from my father's parole officer and they said, you know, just so you know, we got to tell you that we moved your father to a minimum security prison and it was near my, it was not far from me. Oh, wow. Before he was across the country and it felt safer. Yes. But then he was in my city like a half hour, you know, or whatever away. And I remember my PTSD just went wild. I yeah. started having these awful um, flashbacks and these horrible nightmares and really awful. I would think I saw him everywhere I went. I was like, <gasps> you know, those, ugh. so I remember thinking, well, this is it. Well, I've come so far, but now I want to throw in the towel. I don't want to live anymore. This is too much for me. It was very, very painful. Right. So I'm thankfully, if nothing stubborn as ever. And so <laughs> I remember thinking, you know, he took so much from me and yeah. now I'm thinking I'm going to give him the rest. 
Right. You know, because I was yes. really I didn't want to be here anymore. I thought this is this sucks. Like this life sucks. <laughs> like, this isn't fair. Yeah. And, yeah. So I thought, you know what? I gotta give my peace of my mind. At least before I die, I gotta, you know, yell at this idiot. Right. So I went to the prison. I said, you know, called and made an appointment, go in there, I get, you know, frisked and sign in and everything. And then it was so nerve wracking. I ran out the door back into the street like three times. I couldn't right. do it the parole officer, I went back in, I'm like, <laughs> and she said, you know, honey, maybe you're not ready. You know, it's okay. Right. She's being very sweet. Yeah. And again, oppositional defiance. I, when she said, you're not ready. I thought, who the, he- I'm so tired of people telling me who I am. Yes. Mm-hmm. You're not going to tell me that I'm not ready. Okay. You don't know anything about me. Yeah. Uh, oh, I just took it out on her in a minute. I was like, you don't know me. I'm ready. Go get him. I'm fine. I can do this. And so it was like, my, <laughs> ego, my ego and my pride were there. Thank goodness. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he came out and he, and I thought, oh, okay. Well, 20 some years have changed you. Um, when you're six, your father is much taller than you. Right. Um, he was this handsome, very good looking, you know, dark skinned, like muscular man. And then I'm looking at him, I'm 25 years old. I'm like, okay, he is the same height as me and I'm not very tall. So we were looking at each other pretty close in the eye. He was quite a bit heavier and bold and I thought oh well this is weird I don't yeah. I don't feel afraid of you and yeah because like I wasn't looking up to this big scary monster I right I crossed from a very sad old man and he just seemed weak to me and yeah I just remember so he says he thought I, he couldn't recognize me at first and then he says who are you and he, I didn't say anything. My throat closed up. Mm. And um, I could hear. I could believe that. Yeah. Yeah, that lump. Hard. Mm-hmm. Especially uh, growing up being abused, where you're not allowed to use your voice. Yeah. Even now, when I get upset, my throat really hurts. You know. Yes. It's that chakra that wants to express, but I'm like, yes, definitely, hundred percent. So he says, "Princess," and that was what he always called me, and I just crumbled. And I nodded and he said, can I hug you? And I turned into about a six-year-old girl and I nodded because it makes me tear up. I think there's always a part of me, you know, people call it daddy issues. You just want your dad to choose you and to save you and to protect you. That was his job. He's failed ethically. Yes. So he comes and hugs me. We collapse into each other's arms. We cry for a very long time, what felt like a long time. And then I composed myself thinking, get away from me, you idiot. And (laughs) then I started yelling at him. And um, you're not allowed to yell at people in prison, just FYI. Um, (laughs) Frown upon losing your temper in prison, not recommended. So yeah, the parole officers, guards, you know, can't do that here. I was like, I came to tell them off. They're like, yeah, you're not allowed to do that. I'm like, oh, all right. They're like, can you have a civil conversation at this table? I'm like, I guess. So I thought, okay, you know what? You need to apologize. And he goes, for what? For what? Yeah. I was like, uh, killing my mom. And he goes, me? I didn't kill her. And I got to say, Stacey, in my whole life, not once did it go into my little brain that this man would deny doing that. Wow. And then it made sense. He pled not guilty. He, he continues to say he didn't do it. He doesn't know what happened. He doesn't remember. He lost control and he probably went blank or he just sometimes he lied. He he didn't lose control because he planned it. It was premeditated. Oh, it was premeditated. I see. Because he did. He came in the house. He had the knife already. He walked in the room with you next to him, next to her. He just lived there. So, yeah. And the neighbors actually were able to say this one particular neighbor that she saw him outside the house every night that week practicing going no way opening the door going in and timing himself (gasps) get his watch how long does it take to open the door how long does it take to oh my gosh yeah he left and locked the door this is not a heat of the moment like this is what they you know he's wow because you know some people like some people go they do something really violent and they go blank and they can't remember 
but yeah. he pre he premeditated the whole thing yeah. and he practiced. Oh my god! Exactly. And he practiced, and he even like coming in and telling me to be quiet. You know, if you're in a oh, if you're off the you know you're in rocker and you're mad, you're not telling people like shh. You know that that is not anyway. So it was proven in court. This is a something that was planned. You yes, right? oh, you, you, wow. So yeah, so I'm looking at him and I'm like. Oh my god, are you gonna lie to my face? Wow. I I kind of giggled. Like I thought, oh my god, I feel so foolish. I gave you so much credit. That is so bizarre. Like I'm a very integral, honest person. And I just yes. was like, oh my god, okay, wow, excuse me, you know, convincing someone to be in integrity when they are in prison for murdering someone yeah a little silly and I felt really sheepish I was like okay so I'm not getting my apology and I heard this little voice in my head that said just get what you can and I thought what can you get tell me about my mom what was she like because in all my life, no one wants to talk about her because grief makes people uncomfortable. And yes. I mm -hmm. So I didn't have a lot of stories. So I thought, well, if this idiot can give me that, at least I didn't waste my day. And so he started, date, you know, he could see his eyes kind of cloud over and he thought of her and he got so happy. And he's like, oh, I love your mother. And, you know, I think about her all the time. And I know she would know that I didn't do this. Like, just weird. Like, he's crazy, you know? Like, I was like, oh, okay. You've told yourself the story for over 20 years. You believe it yourself, right? I was going to say, sometimes people could lie to themselves so much that they yeah. actually believe their lies after right? so long. And so, surely, yeah. yeah, like surely you're traumatized, obviously, as well. Like he's not well. Um, you, you can't be well and kill someone and you can't be the no. same after. Well, right? Anyone that, anyone that, that attempts to kill another person is not well to begin with you don't you don't go you don't do something like that right. as violent as that unless there's something mentally not right that right? stabilizes you in your brain yeah yeah so I'm thinking I just heard that voice I was like just get what you can like and then I thought thinking on my feet here just tell me about my mom and then he did and you know it was really awkwardly nice like as weird as that sounds like it wasn't nice because he was there it was nice yeah. to hear a story about my mom and what she was like and why they got married and you know it was just like interesting like he was her neighbor from his whole life her next door neighbor knew knew each other forever and I thought how awful like that you felt like you owned her that you could just extinguish her that you yeah had that right in you that is so obviously misogynistic and just disgusting but like yeah. just that you, thought you owned her not even it's so dehumanizing yes. um, and that you didn't care about your children that is also really heart-wrenching so yeah. I heard my stories and then um when I was leaving the prison I was there for hours and I left and I had cried like an enormous amount there yeah and I remember leaving exhausted but there was this peace in me that I wasn't afraid. You know, yeah. this is someone who lived in my head, mm -hmm. <laughs> rent free. And as I left the prison, I remember feeling like I had been released from prison. Right. I just left and I thought, oh my God, this is like one of the first days of the rest of my life. Right. And I remember just going home and thinking, I didn't tell anyone I went there. I yeah. was again, a very private person. And um, which is why people are shocked that I wrote a memoir. But <laughs> I just went home and I thought I will never let anyone live inside me that way again you will never get to motivate me or manipulate me by my own thoughts and imagination ever again and right. that was for me the moment that I realized like this life I'm here and I you I don't know why I got this card these cards in this hand like I don't know okay yeah but I'm going to play the game as best as I can so that I win for me. Right. I don't give a shit what everyone else is doing. I don't care. Exactly. what. I, like I'm not comparing myself. I'm not better or worse. Right. Than else. I just, am me, here's my hand. Here's what it looks like. Here's my story. Yeah. I love it or lump it. I don't know. This is what I got. So what do you want me to do? Right. Because I'm tired of feeling not good enough. 
And so I just decided, well, can I be good enough for me? Right. Is that, a, is that okay? Can I be my biggest champion? Can I just live because of me? Certainly can. Yeah, I can. And so I thought from then on, I thought, oh, I am not, you, I could take this guy. You're not, I'm not yeah. afraid of you. And you know, as, as strange as it was, a couple of years later, I was at, hanging out with my, my dad, Ron, and we were at an auction and we went to go get a coffee. He goes, oh, can you go get us a coffee at the coffee cart outside? And I go, yeah, sure. Guess who's working the coffee cart? No. Go, yes, my father. Well, I didn't get the coffee. I just saw him and I thought, no, wow. I'm not, we're not having coffee. I go in and I go, yeah, we're not having coffee today. <laughs> he goes, oh yeah. I go, yeah, my father's working the coffee cart. He goes, oh, okay. I, I said, can't oh. believe they let him out. I can't believe yes. after murdering your mother that they let him out, what, in 20-something years? Yeah, 22 years. And in Canada, you only get 25. That's life. Really? Yeah. Wow. I, when I look at the States and they're like, we're hanging this one, we're electrocuting Yeah. This one. Oh, my God. If he lived in America, forget about it. He yeah. had life in prison. Years. Yeah. And I, I know, that's a whole other podcast because I tell you, that doesn't feel right to me that someone, I have to be tortured the rest of my life, but you get 22 years. Got it easy. So... Yeah. So then I, but I was so proud. I didn't leave. We didn't leave. I didn't run away. I didn't get scared and have a panic. Yeah. Attack. I was like, screw you loser. I'm, I'm having a, I'm enjoying my life with my real dad. Yes. If anyone can donate sperm, sir. It takes a real dad to be there and raise a child. So I was, yeah, we left. 100%. And I, yeah. And then I just was, the, the world is my oyster. I said, what are you going to do now? And I thought, I just want to be so happy and fabulous. That's what I'm going to do. And so I went back to university and I, I ended up moving to the West Coast and got an amazing job. And, Good and for you. I, yeah, and then I started a shoe company, which is why I got all these shoes. They're my Oh, little nice. <laughs> I like them. Red's one of my favorite colors. I like it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I started a shoe company. And you know, what's interesting. You talked about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that's what we're always told is that you need to forgive. You know, you got to move on. Yeah. And I used to think that too. And then I realized that forgiveness is actually a gift that you don't get to choose. You know, you can be open to it. Yeah. It'll come to you when you have, you got to get to a certain place before it comes to you. Like it's oh, like, a hundred percent. It took me decades to get to that point in some certain totally. situations, you know, yeah. it was like, you know, it got to the point where it was hurting me more to hold that anger inside it was actually doing damage to me. And at one point I had to look at that person and say, okay, you know, that person's not all there. That person had a bad life. That person, I had to look at that person as a whole and try to put myself in their shoes, not justifying what they did, but yeah. understanding why they are the person they are. And then saying, you know what? I forgive you. And not say, you know, saying I have to like them or be their friend or I have to, you know, You're associate with them. But yeah. I don't have to tell them either. But in my mind, I was like, I forgive you for the things that you did to me that were hurtful and caused harm to me. Right. And just, it's like a, like a dove kind of flew away from me. You know, it was like, I just I let that brick, that dove came. I put that brick on that dove yeah. and they flew away and I moved on and I mm -hmm. didn't focus or dwell on it. I just said, that's the past. I can't change the past. Mm -hmm. And I got yeah, today is a new day and I just focused on now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the acceptance of what occurred and the acceptance that it is just the way it went. Right. Yes. And I think a lot of people need to hear this. You don't have to forgive. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. You can, like when I teach grief recovery, the curriculum that I teach, mm -hmm. whether or not you forgive, you're going to get the result that you just like that you get because you're going to get that freedom, that completion, that right. recovery. Because even acknowledging the severe emotional statement of things, like yes. the, the significance of the pain, yeah. is, is as cathartic as the forgiveness that you might not get. You know, you might not get there. Well, I didn't so, ever told that person. I just, exactly. I you did it. I did it privately to myself because right. you might, if you go to that person, they might be in denial and say, I didn't do that. I didn't yeah. want this. And then you're yeah. going to be even more upset. But if in your head, you have a process where you could just learn to move forward. Like yes. you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. You complete the energy, right? But you complete the relationship because a lot of times what people do is the relationship didn't get a full completion. So there's, yes. 
there's no closure what people call closure right or you're in the shower and you're like that jerk i should have said this why didn't they say that you know right. oh, this yep. is a good one i can't believe you did this yes and, exactly um, there came a day where i woke up and i thought of my father and i thought yeah yeah he killed her that's what he did and it was then that i realized that's forgiveness to me because i used to go I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you. How could you? What's wrong with you? Why would you do that to me? And there was all these questions. And then there was a day where it was, yep, that's the truth. And I thought, oh, that feels much better. <laughs> I think, okay, yeah, I think I forgive him. Oh my God. I'm not going to tell him. I don't need to tell him. It doesn't matter. Your yeah. forgiveness and your recovery have nothing to do with the other person. You don't need the other person to participate. You do not. All. No, you do not. No. And I think a lot of survivors of severe, horrible, adverse experiences need to hear that just because someone came and robbed you of your innocence, your childhood, your, you know, good heart and that those good experiences that gave them, you know, you feel like that person is very powerful because they came and they yes. took it from you. And I think a lot of us for myself, for, for sure, I used to think, well, I'm not powerful. So now I got to wait for someone to come make me happy yeah Where, where's prince charming i gotta wait i gotta wait for something else to come and do the good because someone else came and did the bad and i'm very powerless and that's not true at all no not, not at, at all, all. Not they at all. Bad, you know bad people do bad stuff that's what happens yep you do the good stuff you don't need them to heal you right need you to heal and exactly. i believe with all my soul that everything that is inside you right now for you to do that you don't need another thing. You don't need to do another thing. You already have everything. Now, people like you and me, we came to be tour guides. Mm -hmm. We'll guide you. If you want, if you want to hear my story and if you find some inspiration in that, or you get an idea, you turn the wrong different corner. Hey, I've been up the mountain a hundred thousand times. Right. I could take you a shortcut if you want. Yeah. But I totally respect if you are like me and you like to go the long way half the damn time because that's <laughs> You know, like I'm a very like, no, I'm pretty sure it's this way. And then, you know, <laughs> seven hours later, I'm back at the base and I'm going, okay, anyway, yeah, sure. Where are we going? You got a little shortcut? Yeah, you got to uh -huh. the street. So I feel like I tell my clients that like, you're the powerful one here. Don't you ever give me credit for your power. Right, exactly. I'm just sharing. I'm like a lighthouse. I'm sharing my light. Just make sure you don't hit the rocks. If you want more, I'll give you more. If it doesn't resonate, don't worry about it, baby. You keep going. I got you. Exactly. Like, this is, there's 8 billion ways to be. Mm -hmm. that and that's what I, t I talk about in my book. I talk about releasing the power within you because mm. like you said, we all have it inside of us, but yeah. people don't realize how powerful of an individual you can be and how much you're capable of being. Right. Because you're so injured because people have reminded you of the wound. Yes. And you need to start hanging out with people that remind you of your greatness. Yes. That is who you really are. 100%. Right? 100%. Yeah. And so the reason I wrote my memoir, Cracked Open, Never Broken, is because I came to a point. So I opened a shoe company. I'm like, this is fun. It's great. I love it. It's a good thing. I love shoes. But I'm like, eh, it's not the thing, you know? And I started chatting to the people at the shoe parties and the like events that I would have. And I'm like, I love connecting with people and talking about trauma. I'm sitting there having a shoe party and I'm talking to people about their grief. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened to you. Well, here you go. And <laughs> but how can I help them more? Right. And it came to me, write a book. I thought, no, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. That's the <laughs> best healing process is to put it on paper. Oh my God. Like her first book, I, I healed myself. And then I healed a bunch of people who read it afterwards. But it was like you, when you dig deep down to your soul, you come to realizations. Yes. It is like therapy on steroids, right? Yes, therapy, it like, is. You just crumble, you cry, you sob, the ugly cry. The, oh my gosh. It is so intense to write a memoir or any kind of book where you're sharing about yourself. Woo! And you don't realize that you, you, in order to, to get better, you get worse and you feel yeah. that pain all over again. But when, once you felt it for the second time, yeah. somehow it just releases out of you. Like you take yeah. in all that, like you talked about all those repressed emotions yeah. and things you imagined in your head. Once you got it out to your dad. Yeah, it's not yours. It's not yours anymore. It's gone. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah. Um, and, you know? and people don't get that. They always, they go, oh my God, aren't you embarrassed that you wrote this book? Or like, you're telling everyone your problems, you know, because <laughs> they're talking about their own projections of how they feel. And I totally yeah. respect, I get it. And I go, 
you know what's the saddest thing about people who abuse you is that they give you they give you something that's not yours they give you shame yeah the only person that should feel ashamed is are the people that hurt people who did it to you yeah uh, and, and that's like, that, that happens a lot you know mm-hmm. people have the shame and the guilt and yeah. they don't know how to get rid of it right they're like i was molested you know i'm ashamed oh i'm like an, well look at the pervert who did that yeah you know, you're disgusting so even society when they go oh what were you wearing what were you doing don't look at me ask why people hurt other people go look at them go look yeah, go, go away. exactly go. you're focusing on the wrong person here yeah so when i started doing that i thought you know what the reason i didn't tell anyone the reason i go quiet the reason it goes on for so long for me is because first of all your absolute mental case and also because <laughs> i didn't say anything yeah because I was scared because you, I believed you when you told me oh, this bad thing's going to happen if you tell anyone. Well, how much worse can it possibly get if I'm being mistreated and abused, right? So, yeah. thinking, so I thought, you know, success is the best, sweetest revenge you can do. And I, I didn't write this book to be vengeful by any means, because if you read it, you'll know it's very generous, yeah. very generous to the people who hurt me. Right. And I do write, though, like Anne Lamont, one of like amazing writers, she she says, you know, if you didn't want to be poorly written about, then don't do bad things. Like, what do you want me to do? Exactly. You hurt me. I have a I have a right and a, my privilege to be able to publish. Oh, 100 percent. You know, like I was generous. I changed your names. I changed everything about you so that no one could go to your house and punch you in the face. But <laughs> that doesn't mean it's not my story to tell. And you can have your shame back. Thanks. Exactly. And I hope other survivors, you know, if you feel safe enough and you have that, you know, that privilege of safety that you can say something about it and be, give the shame back like a hot potato. Like I'm not keeping that. That's yours. Right. I don't have mm-hmm. anything to be embarrassed about. I was a child. Everything that happened to me for 18 years, none of my business. I didn't do it. Right. I didn't do it. Sorry. You don't know how to treat children and children are the most sacred creatures on this earth. So oh, they are. Yes. You know, we got to raise our children to be loving and safe. Yes. And happy, right. Nurtured, supported, connected. Right. So, yeah. So I wrote this book and I was so proud and I was so happy. Like you said, the doves fly out and you're like, oh, and <laughs> everyone else is like crying. They're like, oh my God, I'm so- I can't believe it. I'm and you're like, I'm healed. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm like, is anyone else happy? It's so great. So I just thought it was so funny. I was like, okay, I got to give everyone else the grace period of like processing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you write it, you get that. You already did that. And I'm like, yeah, can we clap? Are we going to clap now? Is everyone, ha-? you know? Yeah. And then, and everyone's crying. I'm like, <laughs> I'm happy. Okay. Yeah. Well, call me in a month when you've got happy to, you know? So yeah, I think it's really, I think those are the things like I continue to go to therapy. I continue to work on myself I think I'm always willing to explore the trauma and toxicity that's been given to me. Yeah. That, Definitely. You know, we're not, like you said before, we're not perfect. And no. when I released my idea of I had to be perfect to be worthy, mm-hmm. now I'm like the, I'm the best beginner. Like I go to do things and be crappy at them. Right. You know? Like, I'm like, oh my God, we're going to learn. Like I, like a couple of years ago, I started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Like I literally get my ass kicked. <laughs> right like it's like i'm not i didn't go there to be the best at everything right I'm like, oh, i just want to learn how to fight that's mm-hmm. cool but if you learn to suck and be happy with learning to be oh the, yeah so much definitely fun. it's so fun you're like you can just go and have fun you don't have to be good exactly and that's how <laughs> i am also it's like like you said you're just learning whether yeah. you get it right or not and i couldn't even care if people laughed i you know yeah. i'll laugh with them because i think yeah. it's funny too you know, yeah. I, you don't take it personally. Your, your skin isn't thin anymore. And it's just, you go yeah. with the flow. And if you it's learn one thing, you. yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you learn one thing every day, like, you know, you're, you're better off 1% better. Yeah. Like I look at the beautiful books behind you, it, you know, how much courage it takes to be able to write something and say, I know what I'm talking about. Right. I know what, you know, it's my perception of what I'm talking about. That's it. That's all it is. I used to think that you had to be this holy magical human to write a book. You know, I thought, oh, wow, I'll never be that. And I thought, oh, I bet there's billions of books. Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, always right now. Why not you? Right. Exactly. You know, like, why not you? And then now I have an almost five-year-old kid and every year we write a book together. And I go, I want to make sure she knows everyone can do magical things. You're magical. You're magic, baby. You're part yes. of the universe. Like, that's, you don't wait for an invitation. Don't no. you, care. you got one by being here and still waking up. 
Exactly. <laughs> that's exactly true. <laughs> like that's your what do you want? It doesn't look the way hers looks or his looks, right? I think I was I thought, oh, I'm an orphan. Like, geez, the world really hates me. Like all like I mustn't be as good as the others. Right. It's like, no, baby, you got your Willy Wonka golden ticket. You're at yes. the chocolate factory. Everyone's lost here baby like nobody knows what the heck they're doing they just keep doing their best i hope right exactly and we the world keeps turning now you mentioned something about you were assaulted now um i you know i have i didn't even realize how many people when i talked about assault with other with other um coaches and professionals that had had experienced assault in their life so many listeners came on to listen because so many people in society have been either sexually assaulted or they have been, you know, assaulted in some type of way that was traumatic and played a traumatic role in their life that they had to undo somehow. And they had, so they could move on and actually have a a quote unquote healthy and happy life, you know, Mm -hmm. and, you know, if you don't mind me asking, what type of assault did you experience? And then how did you learn how to overcome that assault? I was for the decade in foster care. Mm -hmm. I was um, like sexually assaulted, raped. Uh, I was beaten. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I was mentally abused. I was physically abused. I was obviously emotionally abused and yeah, sexually abused. I was different people would, uh, I was, yeah I was there were pedophiles that were all around me my um it was really awful it was and I didn't understand like so I I grew up thinking that the only you know it's so you know the first trauma in my life is a a man took it you know my mother's life and then all these men were assaulting me and it just always felt like the men that are always taking yeah you know it just there's this sense of you know, the patriarchy and misogyny that play into who you become. Like yeah. my only use here is to be pleasing to men and then they won't hurt you, but that's not true. You could be the best woman in the world and they'll still hurt you. Right. You know, people who are awful will just be awful. Like there's no, it's not about anything, you know? So yes. It's not about how I behave. It's like you could be wearing, you know, people say, well, what are you wearing? I mean, so, what are, I was seven. What, what I don't know. I, it has I, nothing to do with that. Like, not, yeah. Like, what are you talking it's about? It's the person, like, that person. Yeah, like, I mean, how do you tell a child what were you wearing? That's disgusting. Like, it you is. Know, it's the person who sexualized a child. Like, so um, for a long time, I just felt so disconnected. You abandon yourself because when your body feels so much pain and your spirit feels so much pain, you just go away, right? You just do a hundred percent. Yeah. And I think that, you know, as your that's your survival so that you can live in these homes. Like, what am I supposed to do with like killing myself? It's like, I just have to escape in my mind. And I remember remember always thinking that like, so disassociating is a pastime, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I just remember thinking that, this isn't how it's supposed to be even this yeah. isn't it okay I remember always telling my talking to myself being like baby when it's up to you you're gonna make it different it's not this they are wrong okay yes. they're not good people and that's why I don't have any problem writing about molesters in my book like you're a pedophile yeah so you deserve to have whatever shame you thought you were giving me you can have it back and yeah and I think it took a long time for me to like understand and I'm still working through it I still like I do so much work and my yeah. life is just about working to like myself and love and cherish myself and I think that's where people will look at me and go wow you have such confidence you know or if I express my boundaries people will be like geez you know I, I hear you really think a lot of yourself and I go you're damn right I do thanks for exactly. noticing exactly yeah. And then and that's what I did to myself too. I, I had to work yeah. on my self-confidence, you know, I deserve it. I deserve yes, it. You are important. And you know, when you look at a little baby, I have personally, I've never seen one child that I've thought, mm, you're not it, you know, you're really not good enough. I've never felt that about a child Yeah, or a child too. Like you are a person and you came here and we look at kids like 
and they go, look at me, I can dance. And they're just doing all kinds of things. And you're like, okay, cool. Yeah. You know, my daughter, look what I made you, mama. She, this morning she drew me. She goes, it's a tornado rainbow. I go, I, can, <laughs> I see it. It's a tornado rainbow. I love that name. That's awesome. Uh-huh. I would never in a million years tell her that's not a rainbow. That's There's no such thing as a tornado rainbow. Uh, I think that makes you a really crappy person. Oh, so yeah. I feel the same about adults. They sit across from me and I see a child and I go, what are your dreams? What do you want to be when you grow up? What are you dreaming about? What's like the like the thing that we could get you to if you didn't have any reality in this world? What would it be? What if, what if we could get you there? What, what yeah. you to be? Oh, you should paint. You should draw. You should dance. Oh, yeah. You should sing. Oh, my God. Right. No one says you're going to be, you know, Beyonce or Barbara Streisand. No one's saying you don't have. There's only one of them. That's yes. that. Exactly. Does that mean you can't be like me, the best car singer in all of Edmonton, Alberta? No, right. I'm the best car singer. I get in my car and I can belt it up. And so <laughs> I deserve to sing. A hundred percent. To dance, you know. Yes. Twenties. I wanted to be a belly dancer. I'm Arab, and I thought, ooh, this is a bit very uh, spicy, and I like yeah. it. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna... and I thought, just go, just yeah. take the class for crying out loud. And I did, and it was liberating. It was like a piece of my mother. Cause we used to do that when I was a little kid with, you know, mm-hmm. in our house, like, you know, Arab women who just dance. And I thought, Oh my God, I became a professional belly dancer. Cause I like to go the extra mile, Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, and I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, what if I imagine who I'd be, if I grew up with confidence and belief and people who supported me, I'd be, you know, on top Flying of high. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like I'm 41 and I just got warmed up. Like, I'm like, oh, what are we doing now? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like now well, I feel like, you know, you know, you act so much younger than your age, but it's, I feel it. I got the energy, you know? Yeah. Maybe that's what it looks like when you're happy at that age. Yeah. You know, when you feel fulfilled. Yeah. And I think success has always meant to me to look in the, in the mirror and be like, yeah, I'm voting for you. Right. I got your back. I'll exactly. be my biggest cheerleader. Like my husband says, he goes, there's going to be a lot of people in the world who tell you, you can't. Oh yeah, definitely. But he goes, don't you dare be one of them. No. Oh, and I was like, Ooh, I like that. You know, some people just don't want you to be a success because they're <laughs> jealous, you know, they, because they, they know that you can, and they just don't, they have the capability, but they just yeah. don't know how to use it. Well, that's the thing. I think they're jealous because you, you doing it reminds them that they're not. Yes. And you know what? I always say jealousy is an invitation. If you feel jealous about me, come ask me. Cause I right. will always, people who do things that they want to and are successful at them. Well, yes. well, I have not met one that wouldn't put their hand out and help you up. No, I know. Yes. That's one. so true. So true. Yeah. yeah I, went always- to a, I went to a seminar and they were people that were so successful. It will just made your mouth drop. And I would introduce myself and say, hello. And I would ask them, so how did you do X, Y, and Z? Oh my God. They, they'd come out and they would tell me this and that they, they'd write down the websites and they yeah. show, tell me the people's names and they tell me, do, do that, do this. Oh, they, go want there, you to, they want you to be up there with them. You That's know, right, because you, there's only one Stacey. You'll no one. I, if I went and wrote everything you did, you know, and I read all your books, I still couldn't do it like you. Right. Exactly. I'll, I'll do it like me. Exactly. And so I mean, there's 8 billion ish of us around here for a reason. Yeah. So, and the way you say something might resonate with some people that if I said the same words, they go, nah, it doesn't hit. It doesn't yeah. me, right? That's why 100%. you'll hear something 20 times and then one teacher will say it and you go, oh, okay. Yes. Yep, 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 yep. Because something about that person's energy resonates with yours and you yeah. can bond and understand that better from them even though we might be giving the same message you might be saying it a few words differently and somehow either your energy or just the way you're wording it yes plays a whole different role in their mind you know or you're like me i'm a slow learner and it takes me 30 times to hear it the 31st you could be my 31st example yeah oh yeah it clicked but it's like opening a jar you know somebody loosened it first if you ask you know you're like i loosened it for you because yeah but it's like, what, so when I meet someone who resonates with me, the way I talk, I know I'm kind of silly. I'm quirky. I'm down to earth, yeah. like a potty mouth. You know, I, I'm trying to be the people's people. Like I, I'm not trying to, 
act in a certain way. Right. Exactly. There are millions of people who resonate with me. Right. That's it. So I'm there's it's not a pie. There's not like, oh, Stacy took a piece now. There's only this many pieces left. No. Right. It's what can I do in this life that feels right for me? Exactly. To make I want to shout it from the rooftops. If like you said about people who read your stuff and then they say, you saved my life. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't tell you how many people read my book because I'm going to just do like a, you know, yeah, show everybody your book. People have read this book and told me I, I left my abuser because of that story. I didn't want to end up That's like amazing. That's yeah. Amazing. They go, I was going to kill myself. And then I started working with you and I realized like you, you show me that there's so much inside of me that I still have show to show them the book again and, and tell them the title. So they okay. know it's cracked open, never broken. And I think you know, the title came to me in a workshop with Gabby Bernstein. She wrote my, my forward. Um, I don't know, awesome. if you know who that is, but she's amazing in that she, you know, I was in her workshop and, and I remember thinking that I used to always say that I was broken. Like, you know, yeah. now I hate it. I'm allergic. Never call yourself broken. It's not true. And I thought, no, no, honey, you're like an egg. You're just being cracked open. You know? Yeah. It, but from the inside, the chick always thinks, ah, the world might be ending. The sky's falling. And it's like, no, that's just your evolution. Yeah. That's what makes sense. Yeah. I think that's what gives you so much, you know, gives you the energy is that you accomplish what it's outstanding when you're able to, you help people who are being abused, have the courage to leave the situation, that abusive situation and get out of there so they could heal themselves and actually live a life, the ideal life for them. Right. Because how other people treat you, whether it's good or bad has nothing to do with you. Exactly. It has nothing to do with you. That's nothing. And so many people feel guilty or they feel responsible. They oh. want to take the blame, but it's not you. It's them. You did nothing. You don't yeah. deserve it. You know? That's right. And like, if someone's kind to you, it's because they're kind. Yeah. That's them. It's not you. If someone's hurtful to you, it's because they're hurtful. It's not you. And I tell that to my kid. I go, you know, someone makes fun of you. You know what that means? They don't see your light. They don't see your magic, baby. Yeah. But that doesn't mean the magic's not there. It means they're blind. Exactly. So we don't change for the audience. No. I don't don't write my books to for the audience. I don't give speeches for the audience. I came here to say what I had to say. Yes. And you're going to get what I felt needed to be delivered. Exactly. It's like, so I think, you know that's how you stay authentic it's if you just quiet what your mom and dad think and your brother's saying and whoever you know if you just quiet that sound and just ask yourself what you think about you and the world and your perception you're gonna move the world you're gonna make such an impact right that's empowerment is being sure here yes definitely and i have a question for you because (laughs) how there, I know so many people that have been abused by other men and mm-hmm. they build up a wall and they can't trust mm-hmm. men anymore. And they get into, they can't even get into a healthy relationship because they distrust or they have so much anger towards any man that comes into their life. Mm-hmm. Now you got married, you had a beautiful child. How were you able to, after being hurt by so many men, how were you able to build that trust? Because people who are in those, like have those experiences, you have, you do lose trust because you think, how could you do that to me? What the heck? I don't, I used to think, oh my God, I don't want to date another person. They're going to be just as crazy as the last one. Yeah. Until I realized that first of all, I didn't, not only did I not know how they were going to act, I don't know who I am at the time. Right. 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 I'm not having any boundaries. I'm allowed to say a hundred percent how I will be treated. Right. So I can be like, yeah you're not allowed to yell at me. You're not allowed to swear at me. You're not allowed to do this. And I really like people who open doors and I like this kind of stuff, whatever it is, you're allowed to just make a list. You can be the pickiest person on the whole planet. Yes. And when people don't do it, you go, okay, next. Yeah. No, I'm not changing for you. No, there are non-negotiables. These are them. Here's the list. If you don't like it, piss off. There's a line move. Exactly. I don't care. I'll be alone. I'd rather be alone than be abused. A hundred percent. Right. Like, yeah. And so I don't look for potential. If I think, oh, of course, everyone has potential. Every, like I said, every baby was born beautiful. Everyone yeah. is worthy of being here, but how you act, that says a lot about where you're at. And yes. 
So it's like trying to, you know, you buy a Honda Civic and you're trying to make it into a Ferrari. Good luck. <laughs> good luck. Like, good luck. The doors don't fit. The tires don't, nothing on it. You're just going to have a very shoddy looking piece of crap. Yeah. And it's painful. It's going to cost you more. You just, you know what? The better idea is go make money, go figure out how to get a Ferrari. And exactly. yeah, like go hang out with people who drive Ferraris, go hang out where the Ferraris are made, like go do that because you're going to have better luck than trying to Jimmy a friggin' like crappy, you know? Exactly. So, yeah. Like, so when people, I started saying it to myself, you have to meet your own expectations. I started saying, yes. you know, I remember once I was always the, like, I was dating guys that were always late, but like with no reason, you know, they just didn't care. They weren't respectful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember dating this one guy, like super successful too. Like it wasn't like, you know, he, and so he's like, oh, he could just, he just thought he could treat me like that. And I would say to him, you know, you just got to send me a text. It just takes a few minutes. I don't really yeah. like waiting. You know, what if you get in a car accident? I don't know. I'm worried. Right. And he thought he's too good for that. So I said to myself, the next time that man is late, I'm not going to the door. Mm -hmm. Good for you. And then you have to show up for yourself. So you're going to tell the universe what you think. And then the universe is going to go, oh, are you sure? So this man's at my door and I'm like, nope, I'm not answering. I'm not coming. I'm done. I'm putting my jammies on. I'm watching Sex and the City. Leave me alone. Exactly. And he's texting, texting. No, you don't exist anymore. And the next day he goes, oh, I was at your house. I was there, you know, knocked for half an hour. I go, yeah, we're done. Like we're done. I don't have it. I told you not to be late. I told you to send me a text. Yes. And you seem to continuously disrespect me and I don't like it. And that's not how I will be treated. There are many people who will be more pleasant, more adaptable and more respectful. So I don't need you. And I felt so he was, you know, thought I was a jerk, but I felt so empowered. That is great. You know, I went in, I had, you know, lots of moments in my life where I endured a lot of tragedy and the, they, when I, I, at a very young age, I went through a lot. And then I, I had mentally created a list. I got to a certain point in my life where I had mentally, I had a list. And if the person wasn't going to meet all these expectations, then I wasn't going to be with them. And, you know, you get to a point where you have to, you know, once you're, you feel good enough of a person, you, you start to think, what do I want from my life? Who do I want to spend the rest of my life with? What type of person? And then right. you start to create all these little things in your head. And then you have to realize, don't settle for any less. No, you get to say, you know, what reality looks like for you. Yeah. And I'm not overshadowing or bypassing privilege and access and ability i'm not saying that like oh if you just wanted to you could no no i'm saying you get to decide what makes a good friend yes. you get to decide what you enjoy in a partner yes you know and that starts with learning about yourself what mm -hmm. do you like who are you so i went on this thing where i started dating myself because mm -hmm. I am one of those people that will do over the top things for other people, but I would yes. never do it for me. Like I would make you a five course meal, but I wouldn't do it for myself. <laughs> that would be such a waste. So just for I, me, yeah, I do right? the same thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I started to do that. I'm like, oh my God, we're going to the farmer's market. We're getting all the nice yummy stuff. We're buying the expensive lamb. We're coming home and we're learning this really, oh, I'm getting the wine pairings. I'm spoiling myself. And I would start to do that and date myself and go to a restaurant. I had never eaten by myself, you know? Right. I, I was scared. I thought, what? A, I feel like a loser. I, I don't have anyone to eat with because of my insecurity was no one loves me and you can see it. But that's right. not true. There's people no, eat a lot not at all. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So this is like, you know, a long time ago. Yeah, and yeah. So I started to nervously show up for the dinner by myself without my phone, no book, like you're not allowed to hide. You just have to stare into the restaurant and eat by yourself. And yeah, I started to realize like taking care of myself was what I had missed from everyone else. Yeah. And that became my life mission was, can I feel connected to myself? Can I feel respected by myself? Yeah. And, and then it became like, I treat myself amazing. So you're going to have to join in on that. If, yes. that's, if you want me to take time away from being alone. <laughs> right. And, you know, I remember, yeah, the first date I went with my husband, it was like, I, he pulled out my chair, he pulled it, just tucked it in. And when I went to go to the washroom, he stood up. And I, thought, I didn't No one had ever done that. I looked at him and I went, Oh, do you have to go too? And he, goes, <laughs> he goes, no. And I go, well, why are you standing up? And he goes for you out of respect. Like, oh my God. Like what? Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? I mean, so he makes it a, you know, an effort to 
always pay attention to me and I we have a joke and I'm like I need to be worshipped and he goes like, <laughs> here I am I like, go oh, I deserve it after this life everyone I because I'm that person in other people's lives you know yeah so I think for anyone listening that's like living in a place where you don't feel like that's the effort that you're making like I will never ask for something I wouldn't do for you right that's the thing like so I'm fabulous I and it took me a really long time because I've been really mistreated to even say that without having to say you know like make an excuse about it or I'm worried that someone's going to think I'm conceited yeah people who are trauma survivors and abuse survivors I tell my clients this you could practice every day to be the most self-centered conceited person on earth and you'll never make it Mm -hmm. I just want the self-esteem of a mediocre man like, yeah. you know, like that's it I just like a mediocre dude because they just look like they have woke up with like the, the privilege of a lifetime right and that's all I, I pretend I'm like okay you know I can never be conceited because I will always have that injury those scars are always on me yeah definitely so yeah so it's like don't listen to anyone else when it doesn't r- resonate with you you are a child of this universe. You are the universe. You have stardust in your bones. You are amazing. You, you know, you deserve people that resonate with you and reflect back to you the greatness that you were born with, that we're all born with. And you're going to meet lots of people that don't believe that about themselves. Right. You can't stop there. You can't listen. You don't have, you have to just stop accepting mediocrity. Stop it. When someone's like, oh, life isn't fair. I'm like, what? Of course, it's not fair, but that's not a goalpost that I have. I'm not looking for life to be fair. I'm looking for it to be, you know, prosperous, joyous, healing, fun. You know, like those are, I don't need to be comfortable because everyone talks about that. Like, well, that's not very comfortable. I'm like, I haven't been comfortable a day on this planet. I am not comfortable here on earth, you know? Yeah. I don't need to be comfortable. I don't need to be perfect. No. I'm just here. And I'm, mm-hmm. I just love to laugh. I love to help people. I love to help heal. Yes. I love to to work through grief and be that person that will suffer with you, love you anyway, and don't expect anything to be hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I heard the greatest thing is from a really successful person, and they said, "Don't look at a problem or an obstacle as a bad thing. It's actually a good thing because yeah. once you learn how to overcome it, it's changed you and made you a." better yeah. person. You know what I mean? If you, you have to look at it in a more positive sense, it gave you either strength, it gave you knowledge, it gave you some type of wisdom. So it really enhanced you as a person. Yeah. It's a superpower. It's a superpower. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you don't, you look at it as a negative sense. It's going to make you a better person. But there right? have been a few times when I looked up in the air and I said, listen, God, I'm pretty good. I'm, yeah. I'm at a really good level. I don't need any more obstacles. I don't right? need any more problems. I'm pretty good. I think I'm a pretty strong person, you know? Yeah. But, you know, like- <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I, it really does though. Each problem, each obstacle in life will, will enhance you in a good way. And it's also made me look at people differently. Totally. I had, I would not just like you, I would not have that love, that compassion, those things. If I didn't go through everything in life that I did. Right? Yeah. Like my dad, Ron, he always says, you know, you don't get to be a good problem solver if you don't have a lot of problems. That's true. And I go, <laughs> and like he, he's always looking at the sunny side of the street. So I think it's yeah. important to look at the sunny side, but don't overlook that you're right. dark, the darkness, you know, thunderstorms and rain have a place here too. And yeah. You're made up of all of those things. You are a beautiful, you know, just in a whole, whole universe inside of yourself. So yeah. I think a lot of the spirituality, these, you know, I hear a lot of people, they bypass the darkness that brought you here, but you wouldn't know how beautifully loving you were if you didn't feel a lot of that pain. Yes. It's like, I embrace the shadow side of myself as well. Like I'm, I'm a mix of the, but we all are, we're a mix yeah. of masculine, feminine, dark light, you know, it's like this beautiful alchemy that happens in your soul and i think that it's a cocktail of things that make us unique and make us the good person that we are yeah and that's you and i think that's the thing is like just you're here you woke up what a privilege celebrate how are you going to celebrate exactly now tell me you have written more than one book that the besides this memoir what else have you done so I i write a book for my so i have three children's books i'm working on my fourth one now um, you know, the first one I wrote is called, her name is Raphael, my daughter. 
and we call her Fifi as a nickname. And so it's Fifi's morning song and Fifi's alphabet book. And then Fifi goes to preschool. I like that. Yeah. So every year I want to listen wherever she's at, you know, in her life. And so that she graduates with a library is kind of what I want because yeah, your books last a lot longer than you ever will, you know? So yeah. I think it would be so cool. I try to give her what I wish I had of my mother. That's all like, so, right. Yeah. You know, like I wish my mother, you know, was able, had the time and the, and the opportunity and the access to do right. Anything. So I'm currently writing a book about my mother and the lessons that I learned from her in such a short nice. time. I like that. Yeah, I like so, that a lot. Yeah. There's so many books coming. So I have a grief recovery handbook. I'm going to write. You Excellent. Know, I like that. People like a workbook kind of thing. And, yeah. And yeah, there's just, I want to write a book of all the things I wish my mother told me. Like, so it's a whole different book for my daughter, just like every life thing that you could give advice. And I think people who don't have mothers or their mothers aren't people that are, you know, in their lives, I think will will like that maybe that that can resonate with someone else because like if it wasn't for strangers I wouldn't really have a lot in this life so I always think like yeah you know aunts and uncles on the internet and moms that like just show up like your sister friends and Uh that kind of stuff and fathers figures that like yes yeah so I'm like you know 100% family are people you get to decide the other ones are just relatives yes I like that you place that perfectly and it's so true yeah, it's because so like true. I don't talk to most of my relatives. Yeah. It's funny because like now that I'm doing well and you know, they weren't around when I was suffering and nobody was around, but right uh, now that I'm doing well, they all pop in, you know, oh hi, you know. Yeah. Like, Let's just forgive and forget. And I'm like, mm, I don't do that. So <laughs> yeah. I, I forgive and I don't forget and I don't need you because you showed me that I didn't need you. Thank you. For right. That. Exactly. Right. I always so, say there's like, like you said, uh, that was perfect. They are family and they are relatives. And I would always say to people, you have your friends and you have your acquaintances, you know? Yeah. So, you know, you know, after a while, you know, who is who, and yeah. it doesn't mean you can't say hello or talk to them when they're in the room. Oh. It's just, you know, who your true friends are. That's right. Know? And it's exactly. a little bit different, you know? Yeah. And I tell people like, I don't have anything against you, but I don't have anything for you. Yes. Perfect. I like that. You know, cause you know, I, like I don't, that. I don't owe you anything. No. And I think that's a, that's a really confident place to be in is where I've realized like those people, as much as I w- I've cried and wished that they showed up differently for me, yeah. they, they didn't and they didn't. I'm still fabulous. So right. yes, exactly. I did need you would have been nice, but I didn't get it. So I'm right. You know, you taught me how to be without you. And now that's the way I am. So I believe everything happens for a reason. We may not yeah. understand it at the time when it happens, but then if, after we pass that stage, if we look back, we sometimes like, I feel personally, I feel like, well, I would have gone down a totally different road if that person didn't did this, or if right. I didn't do that, you know? So yeah. sometimes, you know, pathways can change according to the yeah. decisions yeah. you make in life. For but sure. I, I think there is a destiny out there for us. And I think some, there is a pathway yeah. But, you know, and I think our inner instincts kind of gives us the direction, whether mm-hmm. we choose that direction or if yeah. we, you know, go right instead when it says, I think you should go left, you know what right. I mean? Yeah. So, following that intuition and that feeling. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I've always believed that I don't think everything happens for a reason, but I believe I can find a reason for everything. Yeah. And so I, mm-hmm. I find that to be the scrappy, resilient part of me is like, you know, I don't know. Like, I don't think there's, you know, for me, a, a reason why children are injured or, or hurt or. Right. No, like, I, I really have a hard time because I've had a lot of, some people have tried to like convince me like, yeah, they chose it. And I'm like, yeah, I, it doesn't sit well with me personally to think about children like that, but no, I agree. You know, yeah. But when I think our survivors and, and people that overcome, I think we can look and find the gold nugget in the manure pile you know like yeah I think that's the best that that is even better than what I said I think I I like that you know there is when we go through life it's it's not it's not right that children would have to go through things like that but to find like you said the golden nugget in the manure yeah that that that, that, that's pretty you know that's a pretty good way yeah you know you're just there is a a shiny diamond somewhere or a piece of nugget somewhere and you take that and you and you you take it with you and you learn from it and you value it and you know 
it makes you remember the past, but then yet yeah. it gives you the energy and the momentum to move <laughs> forward. Yeah. And you don't go home empty handed. Like when my father, you know, if I wouldn't have asked him other questions, I would have went home empty handed. I would have felt like, right. Oh, man, this really sucks. You know, it's even worse than I thought. You yeah. Know? Instead I was like, can I make something good here? Can I, can I go home with something? Yes. And, okay, great. Tell me a story about my mom. Sure. If that's what I hate, it's better than nothing. Exactly. And I didn't go home empty handed. I went home full hearted. And that is the difference. I like that. I Cause some Anytime. people will just run out of the room. I yeah. like that. And they become their own victims. A lot of times, like I used to be that part, like I would just, oh, poor me, this life sucks, you know, and, and don't get me wrong. You're allowed to sit there for a few minutes and feel sorry for yourself because I really think that's an important healing process. Of yeah. Like, you got to feel it and go, this sucks. I don't like this. Yeah. But then I always say like, I'm not about, I'm not trying to avoid falling down because I'm a clumsy lady, but yeah. I always fall. I will fall down, but you will catch me back up. Like I yes. will get back up. So hundred percent. Yeah. So that's the thing. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'll dig, if you give me a pile of crap, I'll dig through it till I find the gold nugget that I yeah. can move forward. So it wasn't wasted. You right. Know? Yes. So, yeah. I love that. I'm so glad. I love talking to people that get it. And it's, it's what makes I definitely do. Yeah. Now tell me about your website. Cause you have different services and you have different things. Can you tell everybody about a little bit about your website, the name of it and all the different things on your website? Sure. So it's imangatti.com. I am in G-A-T-T-I.com. And I am like offering, I offer courses. I teach people how to write their first memoirs. I teach people how to give their first talks and I'm actually opening up a whole new thing. So I'd love her if you join the newsletter so you can be in touch yeah. with me. Um, I have a Patreon that you can support and, and come see behind the scenes things and things that I don't share with everybody. Yeah. Also work one-on-one -on -one with select amounts of people, obviously, um, to do the grief recovery curriculum that I have through the grief recovery Institute. And I work with people like just to overcome those things and then coach them, help them get, you know, it's funny. I work with men and women. So and, and trans people like anyone who has mm -hmm. you know a soul that wants to get more involved in themselves I love working with people who are ready to access that greatness that they already have and so yeah so anyone who wants to find me is always Iman Gaddy on TikTok on Facebook on um, Instagram those are the places where I like to hang out and I would love to hear from you, even if it's just to say hello. I'm always happy to connect. Definitely, yeah. You'll get me on your on your email list. Definitely. Yeah, likewise, I was following. I looked at your stuff. I was like, oh, I'm so excited to meet you because I read your story and just amazing. Like it's amazing to you know know a fellow survivor of the and the resilient human that continues mm. to defy anything that anyone tells you your limitations are. I think that's. I appreciate For that. Sure. Thank you. And and the yeah. same goes here. I, I give you, um, you know, a hundred kudos and a half, you know, like yeah. everything you've been through and you didn't let it, it knock you down. And when it did knock you down, you got right back up, you know, yeah. you didn't permanently let it knock you down. You got wow. up back up and that's the trick is, is getting back up. And, yeah. you know, we all have a purpose in life and we have to just keep moving forward and until yeah. we find that purpose and, you know, not give up, not give up. Love it. You know? Yeah. Never give up. Just keep going. Right. And if you're lucky, you'll wake up again. You do it again. Exactly. Now, <laughs> if you had to give like maybe three things to the audience, three things, you, three tips on, on what we talked about today. Is there anything you like to tell them that, you know, I like to tell people to take inventory of yourself. So take inventory, write it down, just sit down, write down everything that you have. That is a privilege that you have, you know, whether it's, you know, if you have money or people that love you or your health or whatever, and then write down the things that three things that you feel like, eh, you know, I don't have these and it's kind of bitter about it. And I wish I had these things. Right. Yeah. And then I like to ask people to write down who are your biggest cheerleaders? Who are the people in your life that really, really, really pump your tires? And then again, right. The people who you kind of cringe around, you're, you know, you don't really get excited to go hang out with them and they yeah. kind of feel like they sabotage you or aren't happy for you. Right. And I feel like that will get people to a place of understanding who's on their team, what they're here for, what their strengths are. And then I like to work with people and say, what's the worst thing that ever happened to you? Right. What's the worst thing that ever happened to you in this life. And what did you learn from that? Right. What gold can you find in that crap pile? That, <laughs> you know, that you feel like because of that, 
Right. And then what, what is the negative thing about that? Like, what is it that you feel like you would like for me, you know, I would, I would have been, oh my gosh, I would have been more confident. I would have had more self-esteem. I would have felt safe and connected. I, I'd yes. probably be a, you know, a billionaire. Like, you know, so it's like, there's a lot of things that your privilege would have helped to be healthier yeah. and just being honest about those things. And then if you could feel safe, what would you do to get to the next step? That's great. What would you do? Who would you call? Would you call a therapist? Do you want to work with the life coach? Do you want to write a book? What, what is it that you think you need to do? Because I think when you ask these things, your little voice is going to say something to you. And I think that's the answer for you. I definitely think so too. Yeah. I think, you know, I think our voice is always there to tell us and w- but we have to ask it, you know, yes. or sometimes it just pops in your head sometimes, you know, and, yes. some, you know, and you have to just be aware and learn to listen. Yes. And I think that's the thing. Like, I, I'm not a religious person, but I pray every day and I don't think you gotta be religious to pray. No. And so praying is always asking stuff and sitting still. And I mean, still I have ADHD. So still to me is like putting yes. music on and lightly move in. Okay. It's not really that still, but then I'm, I'm listening. Yes. So it's like, if you're going to pray, you got to sit down and listen. A hundred percent. You got to yes. like be able to like, whatever in the shower is a meditation. Walking is a meditation in the forest is meditative beach, whatever your elements are. Right. Zip it and don't have anything, no one around you. Just be with yourself and you'll hear it. You'll hear it. Yeah. I think that was more than three things, but you know, you get the point. No, I get the point. <laughs> I think that was great. I think that was great. Thank so, you. You're very welcome. Once again, just tell everybody that your website's name so they don't forget it. Emangetty.com. Eman, it's been such a pleasure having you on the show. You know, I loved having you. You gave out so much information and I truly, truly thank you for sharing such a mm-hmm. private and, and intimate story with us, you know, and letting the world know what you went through and then giving them the courage and the motivation to see that they too can overcome, you know, that it just because we go through trauma and tragedy in our life doesn't mean life ends. That's right. It, you know, it, it it's a growing experience, but we just have to get over that triumph of obstacles and mm-hmm. we have to just learn from what we went through and then change it into something positive and move forward in life. And yeah. our dreams could always become our reality if we like. That's right. That's right. I think that's so true. And I think everyone is worthy and capable of recovering. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for having me. What a privilege. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much for being on the show. It's been great having you. Thanks, Stacey. You have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.